Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, this is Craig Garber. You know me as host of the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, but when I'm not interviewing world-class guitar players, I'm busy helping clients with their marketing. In fact, since March of 2000, I've helped over 300 clients in 108 different industries all over the world sell everything from $20 books to $5,000 seminar seats and everything in between. I even authored a book about my experience called How to Make Maximum Money with Minimum Customers. Now, if you own or operate a business, ask yourself the following marketing-related questions and be honest with your answers. Are you generating fresh new qualified leads on a daily basis? Is your website generating enough sales? And if not, do you know why? Is your advertising effective? Is it predictably and reliably making you several multiples of what you're spending on it? And lastly, are you consistently communicating with your email list? Or do you have an email list of prospects and customers, but you have no idea what to say to them, how often to say it, or how to make money with this list? If you need solutions for these marketing problems, then you need to book a one-on-one marketing strategy session with me. After this strategy session, you'll know how to speak to and make money with your email list, how to use your website to attract customers and clients who are ready to buy from you now, and how to sell your goods and services for top dollar and at much higher profit margins than your competition. Listen, stop hoping things will get better on their own. Hope is not a very good business strategy. Instead, book a marketing strategy session with me by going to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash marketing and find out if your business meets the five criteria you need to qualify for this service. Again, that's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash marketing. Thanks for listening. Now let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. I've got a great guitarist, a really cool guy, and uh, unusual. What happened was... I was having all these guitar players from Nashville, and I said, I need a challenge. And I said, can I find a Puerto Rican guitarist in Nashville? I said, that's not enough of a challenge. I said, can I find a Puerto Rican guitarist from the Bronx in Nashville? And man, guess what? The universe gave me Chris Rodriguez, (laughs) who we have today, who's an awesome player. He's got a tremendous career. He's a really cool guy. Uh, As I said, he's originally from the Bronx. He moved to Nashville to attend Belmont University and pursue a career in music. Over the years, he's made a name for himself as one of the finest players in Nashville as a studio and touring musician. He plays electric and acoustic guitar, banjo and mandolin, and he also sings lead and backup vocals on stage and in Nashville's session scene, which is unusual. Uh, He's worked across a spectrum of musical genres from country, pop, rock, R&B, and metal to black gospel and Christian. In 1999, Word Records released his solo debut album called Beggar's Paradise, Released in the Latin market as, let's see if I can do this, Chris. Paraiso de un medijo. Did I get it right? Med, yeah. All right. Med, what is it? Med, paraiso de un mendigo. Okay. Thank you. Because I know I butchered it a little bit. Which still garners worldwide attention today. He's worked as a session guitarist and a vocalist on records by people like Garth Brooks, Kelly Clarkson, Amy Grant. Michael W. Smith, Kenny Loggins, Reba McIntyre, Vince Gill, Winona Judd, Michael McDonald, Lionel Richie, Blake Shelton, Faith Hill, Tim McGraw, Steve Winwood, Peter Cetera, Joe D. Messina, Rodney Crowell, Leanne Womack, and Megadeth. He's also played on stage with several morning and late night shows, including American Idol, the Grammys, American Music Awards, ACMs, the CMAs, and the CMA Country Christmas Specials and the Grand Old Opry. Over the last two decades, Chris has toured and performed with Kelly Clarkson, Keith Urban, Peter Cetera, Faith Hill, Shania Twain, Ronnie Dunn, Leanne Rimes, Kenny Loggins, and Billy Currington. And when he isn't traveling the world, he plays with in town in Nashville with the Nashville Alternators. Originally founded in 2010 while organizing a benefit for flood victims, they can be found performing at private and corporate events, fundraisers, trade show, and he also plays at the Titans games and the Nashville Predators games, which he enjoys. He's also served as the musical director in Keb Moe's Monday Night Blues Show at the Studio Gallery at Fontenelle, and he's produced several independent international records such as Ward Thomas from the UK, Ben Mullen out of Canada, Charlie out of Germany and Salvador out of the here in the US. He's endorsed by Duesenberg. I'm hoping I don't mess this up, Chris. Bedell? Bedell. What correct. is Bedell? Uh Bedell guitars are made by Tom Bedell. And Tom owns uh Bedell, Breedlove, and Weber. Oh, awesome. 
all under his roof. Paul Reed Smith, Gibson, A. Davis. What is A. Davis? Art Davis makes a... Well, he did. I, I, don't, I think he's retired now. He made a... You know, boutique acoustic guitars. Oh, cool. This is uh, yeah. interesting. I'm learning a lot here. Category 5 amplification, bad cat amplifiers, and visual sound. Man, thank you so much for your time. So glad to be with you, man. I, I appreciate it. We almost, uh, I'm sorry we didn't connect last week. Chris was down here. We missed each other. It was just bad timing on uh, my wife. I had something going on with our granddaughter, but. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I no. am. Uh, Technically challenged with Skype. <laughs> no, it's all good, man. We'll connect next time you're here, man. Or we'll go meet at Nick's Pizzeria on Gun Hill Road. One of those two. <laughs> now we're talking. Hey, uh, you've done like so much cool stuff, man. Um, I wanted to ask you about some of the artists that you've worked with. If you could share how you got the gig and maybe a cool story or two sure. about them. Uh, or about your experience. Let's start with Garth Brooks. Garth, I got uh, I got an e uh, text message from uh, a great guitar player. Who, if you haven't already talked to Gordon Kennedy, you probably will. Okay. But uh, Gordon, is, uh, you know, I've known Gordon since I went to school at Belmont. I met him at Belmont. Um, so I, met, I met him and Dan Huff within like two days. Of so we we oh, go. Oh wow, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty cool. And Gordon has had Gordon co-wrote. Uh, he's had a lot of hits. He co-wrote uh, "Change the World," which you know clapped and cut. Wow. And from building on that success, he he had uh, a couple cuts on uh, Garth Brooks throughout the years. He's had a lot of cuts. He's worked with Peter Frampton a long time. He's co-produced a few records with with Peter, but. Anyway, about four or five years ago, he sent me a text and said, are you available for a session? It's pretty cool. Uh, I need you to sing. And I'm like, well, yeah. Who is it? And he's, it's Garth Brooks. He's just been in Garth's camp for a long time. So uh, for two days, I went over to Garth's studio here in town. Uh, and it was Gordon Kennedy, Wayne Kirkpatrick, and I on vocals. And it was it was this record that Garth did where he basically recut 50 songs that had shaped his musical life. Wow. The, the two songs I sang on were Doctor My Eyes, Jackson Brown. Great song. And Somebody to Love by Queen. Wow. Good songs, man. Yeah. But like he had cut like Robert Palmer's Addicted to Love. You know, he did a George Jones song on that record. It was kind of all over the musical map. And Garth was just awesome. He was just the coolest guy. He was kind of bouncing around the room like a 15-year-old. You know, like like if he'd never been in a studio before and it was his first day on the gig, you know. He just had <laughs> an incredible enthusiasm for, you know, especially for being the world's number one recording artist. <laughs> yeah. That's not, awesome. Not jaded at all, and just a super guy. He was, he was incredible. You know, uh, he really had done his homework on those songs. You know, he basically became Jackson Brown on the Jackson song. He became, he became the artist he was trying to emulate, and um, and that's how that record came together. I got to spend two awesome nights singing on. on yeah, you know, one time he hit the plate, you know, the talk back and said, gentlemen, respect. Because, like, we were doing these pretty, you know, we did the Queen stuff exactly like the way Queen did it, which meant the three of us who were singing sang in unison, stacked that part three or four times, then went to the third, you know, went a third up, sang that part in unison, stacked that up, went to the fifth, and, you know, which is notoriously the way Queen did it back in the day. I didn't know that. That's really interesting. Yeah. Those guys would sing a perfect unison, stack it, and 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 then subsequently do the same thing for every note in the harmony that they were trying to spell out. So um, 
but Gordon, you know, Wayne Kirkpatrick is like a, an incredible songwriter and he's a playwright. He's had a, a very successful play that was on Broadway last year, Something Rotten. That was like everybody attended it. And uh, so it, and they're and uh, he's a great producer. So, they, they, you know, they're very well read on all all the tricks that happened back in the day on, sure. you know, on, on certain records. And um, I was not aware that Queen did vocals like that. Yeah, that was really interesting. I, I, I mean, if you think back, though, they, you know, there was on some of their songs, like, you know, like, um, you know, obviously Bohemian Rhapsody, you hear the, the, the stacking or the multiple tracks, but I didn't, I didn't realize that was a standard thing for them. Well, you know, I, 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 certainly in, in that period, that's what, pardon me, that's what they were doing. Hmm. Um, probably later on, I don't know, they've always had that, ri- you know, that's that, that's that Queen sound. Now, yeah. now that I hear it, I'm like, every time a Queen song comes on the radio now, I really, I pay twice as much attention, even as I did as a kid. And, and they, they, they were a big deal for me as a kid, hmm. you know. Like Killer Queen was the first thing I ever heard, and I was like, "That that guy's the greatest guitar player I've ever heard." Yeah, he, they have they had some great recording skills, that's for sure. I mean, early on in their career, hmm. they were, you know, I've got the Pro Tool stems for Killer Queen, so like, I can go I can go put it on and just listen to Freddie on piano, you know, or or solo up, you know, the guitar track, which is, I don't know, it's like going to school, you know. That's really cool. I, I have to get with one of you guys next time I come up to Nashville because I've never seen that. That's got to be really interesting to do that. Yeah, I've got some. I've got stems on like Sgt. Pepper. Uh, I've got Marvin Gaye. What's going on? Wow, that's. I a, got the Jackson Five. I want you. Uh, I've got Jackson Five. Uh, I'll be there. That's uh, cool, man. Yeah, yeah. I can just bust it down to like the harpsichord part on it. I'll be there, which is. It's it's really like going to university going it's it's kind of the the greatest way to study a track what speaking and, of universe go ahead, sorry and and then you get to really see the imperfections in the track you know which are don't leave those imperfections out kids you know like it's why good. is that i just think it humanizes everything you know i mean you, you can you can go down the the rabbit hole and make a record as perfect as it can be. Uh, there's a certain amount of flaw that I personally like in a recording. You know, um, although like I love Steely Dan and they make perfect records. You know, yeah. Well, they is is it the recording or the players? I mean, they've got you know they've got some monster players on there. I think I, I, you know, I think Steely Dan, Fagan and Becker, the late Walter Becker. I mean, I think they, 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 they just kept. They were notorious for throwing away great performances, you know, searching for that thing that you know, ding, 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 you know, what made them happy. But I, you know, I love the Police, you know, and Stuart Copeland is is a genius musician and time time kind of moved you know like it wasn't like a linear click track kind of a recording and it's like time moves it's, choruses get faster and just kind of adds to the energy right right depending on what you're going for you know there are certain kind of linear records that i enjoy listening to like i would put the steely dan records in that sort of linear thing where it's perfect time and then there's like you know other other artists where I, I, the music wouldn't benefit from that. It wouldn't be the same thing if it was that perfect. Hmm. Um, early, uh, early what? Early the early police records to me were like. Let's talk about Peter Cetera. And for people who don't know, he was the lead singer for Chicago. Yep. One of the greatest, oh, incredible! One of the greatest living singer bass players I've ever heard. You know, and just and his bass playing doesn't get enough credit. You know, probably because, like, from 1986 to about 
three years ago, he basically put it up on the wall. Um, and now he's playing bass again on the encore of our live show. But if you really go examine his playing on those records, it's really very McCartney-esque kind of bass playing in that sort of jazz rock thing that Chicago did. Very melodic, a lot of good bass hooks in his playing. I always loved his bass playing and certainly loved his singing. Yeah, his voice is, is amazing. Yeah, it's an iconic voice, and, and, and he really blossomed later in their career into being one of the great writers. You know, early on, it was the other guys that were really writing the hits. But uh, from If You Leave Me Now on out, you know, he really stepped up and became, you know, a major contributor to their success. And certainly in the 80s, uh, when he was co-writing all those songs with David Foster. And they had two really humongous records in the 80s. And the hits were coming from Peter at that point. And you're touring with him now. Does he play... So that's I'm assuming that's a lot of what he's doing. Like, what are you yeah, guys doing? Is that what you're playing mostly? Yeah, we do it all. We do it all. I would say when I joined the band, which was 2013, it was the set list was a little more 80s centric. We were doing a bit more of the David Foster stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, we had a couple, you know, we would do If You Leave Me Now and 25 or 6 to 4, which... That's such a great song. Did, did you did you, you had to do the solo on that? Well, Tony Obrada and I split it up. So holy shit, that's a really that's a that's a tough solo. No, I mean not for you, but <laughs> that's a you know it's a tough oh, it's solo. A solo. It's a ridiculous. Every time I hear that solo on the radio, I'm like Terry. The late Terry Cap was just he was unchanged, man. That's yeah. that's very liberated guitar playing you know that's like that's a good way to put it yeah yeah nobody taught that guy how to do i mean it, still what he does to me is kind of uh, it i don't know how it, it was even possible you know like and he really was the leader of the band back then he's he's the guy that counted off all the songs live you know he was the center he was the center attraction as far as the energy in the band, you know, um, which is really wild to say because I, I I thought highly of all those guys, the horn players, Robert yeah. Lamb, he's, you know, they 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 were all monsters in their own right. But Terry Cass was, you know, and there's this, you know, notorious, you know, they opened up twenty shows for Hendrix because he went and saw them at the Whiskey a Go Go. This is when they were kind of a long haired hippie, you know, counterculture band. And Hendrix was like, you know, your guitar player is better than me, you know. Wow. And, yeah, I didn't know this story. That's interesting. I didn't know they opened up for Hendrix. Yeah, he went to see them at Whiskey A Go Go and was like, I guess the story goes, he went backstage and spoke to Walter Parazader, the, the saxophonist, and he's like, your horn section breathes with one lung. <laughs> and your, your guitar player, well, he's better than me, you know. And it's funny because, like, Terry was doing the whole, like, Star Spangled Banner, you know, the guitar as, you know, simulating the bombs, you know, coming off of B-52. It, he might have beat Jimmy to the punch on some of that stuff, you know. They start, you know, he was certainly influenced by, let's just, you know, Hendrix's letter A, you know, let's just say that. Yeah. But, like... There's some stuff that is on the first Chicago record. It's a song called Freeform Guitar, where it's like a strat through a Fender Showman. And that got released on record. You know, it was released eight, nine months before Woodstock. So who was influencing who? You know, I guess. Yeah, yeah I know what you're saying. Yeah. You know, there's a, uh, I don't know if you ever saw these guys online. There's a Russian tribute band called Leonid, L-E-O-N-I-D, that yeah. re Have you seen those guys? Yeah, because Satara turned me on to them. He's they, like, you got to check they, this out. They're really good. Yeah. 
They're very good, man. They got, you know, uh, uh, horn section. I mean, they're very good musicians. Yeah. And they do gr- great re- recreations of, uh, of the songs. They do it. They do it right. There's a band here in town uh, called Make Me Smile. Uh. That, that is uh, run by a friend of mine who also happened. It's one of three bands he has. He has an, a band called 12 Against Nature, which is an all Steely Dan tribute band. And, um, and then he's got a band called uh, uh, Yacht. Well, it's kind of like a Yacht Rock thing. Yacht <laughs> Rock. Got band, but his Chicago band is called Making Smile, and they, they do it. They do it perfectly. And we got some really great horn players in Nashville. We got great horn players here. Hey, so let me ask you a question. Let's get back to Peter. Um, how'd you get the gig with Peter? Well, uh, I had sung on his record starting probably back in 97, 98. Oh, his solo stuff. Solo stuff, yeah. That... Um, so back then he was being produced by either Dan Huff or Michael O'Marty and who was um yeah, I remember that name too. Yeah, Michael is a uh, infamous producer and keyboard player. He's pretty much the main keyboard player on Steely Dan records in the 70s. Okay. Michael O'Marty and then Dan Huff, you know, is a legendary guitar player and I met Dan, you know, I, my second day at Belmont College. He was he went to he went to Belmont for a year. Oh, well, that's interesting. So you met him as a co- as a student, a uh, fellow alumni. I him, yeah, I met him as a student. Same with Gordon Kennedy, who got me on the Garth record. Hmm. Um, we were all, you know, hot shot guitar players at the university. Sure. You know? And um, but Dan, um, uh, and Michael Amardian hired me to sing for Peter. And so I've known Peter since the late 90s. And then in the 2000s, I really didn't see him all that much. Uh, And a friend of mine, who's a great guitar player and vocalist, Gene Miller, was his his main guitar player. And Gene needed a sub. Mm. Uh, So I started as a sub. Wow. And and then eventually Gene was very busy with Amy Grant. so it just kind of floated over to me. That's really and, cool. Uh, yeah. So it's and, a bit of a gamble, like when you become a sub, because you've got to work your ass off to learn a bunch of stuff for what's typically like just a small amount of time, you know, a short period of time. Yeah. But, My first gig yeah. was at Trump Tower in Chicago. <laughs> Interesting. It was a private gig for like 300 lawyers. You know, oh joy, oh joy. <laughs> but uh, it really was not a labor for me at all. I was that hyper a fan of the Terra, yeah, it was like, and of the legion of guitar players that have been on. You know, if, if it wasn't Terry Cast, then later on it was guys like you know Luke that played on Chicago Records, Mike Landau. Uh, a guy named Chris Pinnock. They've always had like amazing guitar players on. Chris Pinnock was isn't he from uh, Kings X or something? No, but that's Doug Pinnock. Okay, Is they, are they related? I don't think so. Uh, Chris uh, Pinnock. He kind of joined the band maybe a couple of years after Terry died, and it was on. It was on some of the, you know, he was on the record that had uh, Hard to Say I'm Sorry. Uh, he was on the first record that Foster had produced. Um, but they've had, all, they've had all these legendary guys, you know, as a guitar gig, it's amazing. Yeah. You know, there's so much territory to cover as a player, you know, and, and it's, it's pretty challenging, you know, for a, for a pop gig. It's it's not three chord rock, you know. Yeah, it's interesting you called it a pop gig. I wouldn't think of that. I don't think of that as pop music, but I guess it is when it comes down to it, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I would call it pop rock. Yeah. I mean, 
know, Chicago, early Chicago to me was like, I don't know, it's like, it was like pr- Prague. Rock. Yeah, like stoner Prague rock almost. It was. Yeah. I mean, it was very, it was hyper blues, but it was super jazzy and lots of time changes. You know, it was, you know, like I always loved Yes and Steve Howe and time changes and, you know, it was that, but kind of in a distinctly American way, you know, like you would never mistake it for like British prog rock. Sure. But it was prog rock American style with like, with the jazz thing, you know, thrown in, which was when I really think about it, Chicago was kind of my first exposure to jazz music, you know, yeah. even though a lot of people would not say they were jazz, but they were certainly jazz. No, they were certainly jazz. So was Steely Dan. Yeah, I mean, they were, they were rock bands that played jazz too, you know, that had a jazz component. Yeah, and like, like I've always worshipped Jeff Beck, you know, and he went to jazz. Sure, you know, I saw Tommy Bolin as a kid. Did you? Purple. Where? Yeah. Oh, with Deep Purple. Miami Highlight. Nineteen. Well, Miami Highlight. That's so funny. He, yeah. I loved his playing. Uh, I mean, very under. You know, you don't hear him a lot, but he was a tremendous player. He played a lot of. Prog and jazz stuff, actually. Yeah, I mean Billy Cobham's Spectrum record. Yep. It's, you know, I'm like, I was. I remember being 14, 15 years old in Miami, and I would listen to like Billy Cobham records as much as I listened to, you know, the Bee Gees doing Jive Talking. You know, it was like, they, <laughs> it right. was all, it was all superstar stuff to me. I, you know, Chick Corea was as big a star to me as, as you know, like Queen. You know, like back then. It was. I listened to all of it, and uh, but Peter Cetera was an early hero of mine. So like, going to learning twenty songs for one private gig, not knowing that there was ever going to be more. It, it was. I w- I would have done it a thousand times over. You know. And how long have you been touring with him now? So four and a half years. Awesome, awesome, man! Congratulations, that's great. He's become a, a great friend and uh, and mentor. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And man, you know what? I'm just looking at a picture of him. He looks pretty good, and you look pretty good. What are you guys doing? <laughs> Neither one of you <laughs> looks like looks close to your age. What's going on, man? What's what? What is the Sacara, the Sestera camp feeding you, dosing you with? You know. He's what I'm shooting for because that's a very young 73 year old dude. Yeah, hell yeah, that's what I'm looking at. There's nothing about him that makes you think he's that age. I mean, he's just got so much vitality and energy, and his pipes are amazing, you know. And he's he's having a lot of fun on stage, which is why we're you know why we're working a lot. You know, when I first joined, he was maybe doing 10, 12 gigs a year private gig but i think the band became something you know the personnel and the band you know became something that gave him it just it's, it was like, like an energy boost and i was always the guy in the band going man let's do more 70s stuff you know which i don't want to take credit for it but we are doing a lot of 70s stuff in the set now that's which, great yeah i mean there was like a whole decade worth the stuff that we were not really investigating and i was like man i think your your audience would really love a bigger snapshot of what you were about in the 1970s so which is looser and rocker and more jammier you know yeah I'm, definitely a lot more jammier i just yeah. uh, just it was great music man i don't know what it was but it was great music you know it's not that mark the arc of the live show is kind of starts out very 80 ish and pop. And then about a halfway to two thirds, it starts shifting into hippie land, you know, like the hippie side of Peter sure. and, and Peter, the bass player, you know, and, uh, and certainly the encore, which is, you know, we'll do like, I'm a man feeling stronger every day. And then 25 to 64. Wow. It's just classic songs, man. Hey, let's talk about Steve Winwood. How'd you get the gig working for him? He's another one of these guys that I've been basically 
trying to chase his mojo since I was a kid, you know? Hmm. Um, I only got to work with him once, and it was a movie soundtrack. Um, and I can't remember the name of the movie, but it was about a pig. It was a cartoon, I think. And uh, he, he was... I hope I'm getting my story right, but he, basically he wrote this song for the movie. Uh, so it was right here on Music Row. I went up for like three hours one morning. It was uh, Bonnie Keen, Marty McCall, and myself. And uh, it was great. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of time for me to like, you know, Winwood, you're you're a rock god. <laughs> album like sign my shirt. You know, I didn't have a. You know, it was kind of like we got in there, got around the piano, and got to work. You know, but it was like very evident what a great musician he was, mm. and, and basically he didn't really do. He didn't perform with us. You know, he was just like maybe change this note. I like that inversion. You know, he was calling the shots, but he was basically producing it. Letting you guys do your thing. Yeah. That's great. But, I mean, I have probably right now never been a bigger Winwood fan than I am right now. Like, And that's, to me, he, he's like one of the British royalty, and I don't know that he gets enough credit. You know, I think he's really as, as great a guitar player as Clapton. I mean... He is a good guitar player, man. I saw him with Santana about ten years ago down here, and um, I was—I I never knew how well he played guitar. I knew, you know, he's a great keyboard player and just a great songwriter. But what a, you know, yeah, he is a great guitar player. Yeah, there's a song from like 1966 called Stevie's Blues that's on Spencer Davis. It's some of the most wicked guitar playing. Like Jeff Beck would have a fever listening to it. You know, it's that good. Stevie's yeah. Blues. I'm just writing it down. I have to check that. Yeah. Out. To me, he sounds like Ray Charles through a Fender Bassman. You know, it's just like cranked up. You know, it's just he's. I went to see him open for Tom Petty two years ago. Wow. And then I saw him open for Steely Dan last summer, or I'm sorry, summer of 2016. And they had no bass player, so it was kind of like traffic. Like he was doing all the bass moves on the V3. You know. And it was cool and old school and really great, just great. Very cool. How about yeah. Vin, how about Vince Gill? How'd you get the gig working with him? So Vince, I've known since probably 1993. I got real lucky. I was out with Amy Grant. Uh, and okay. Quickly enough, I was singing the part of Peter Cetera. That's funny. On a duet called Next Time I Fall, which we do every show with Peter right now. And um, at the concert was Tony Brown, who, legendary producer in Nashville, produced Everybody Under the Sun. It, uh, it, he was almost like, I don't know, he's, he was a power player in Nashville, still is. Um, but back then he was producing Vince, Winona, Reba, uh, Rodney Crowell. He produced everybody. And he was at the show, heard me sing with Amy, and started hiring me on all these country records. Holy shit, how cool is that? That's That was my main entrance into the country world. I had not sung on a single country record. Almost everything I had worked on prior to 1992 was Christian music, gospel music, because I, you know, toured with Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith. You know, I was I was pretty known in that world as a as a session guy, but I hadn't cracked the country nut. And then Tony came out to see an Amy show, and he started hiring me on everything, and I met Vince. And by that time, I had started working with Kenny Loggins. I was on the road with Kenny. Okay. And uh, the very first day I met Vince, I was on 
one of his records and he's like I want you to come on the road with me holy crap I had to turn him down because I had just started working you know full time with Kenny wow but, was that okay so did Jerry wind up going out there well later on I did tour with Vince um I, I ended up doing a Christmas tour with him. We, we probably did 20 dates. And it was Jerry McPherson and I and Vince. We were the three guitar players. And we oh, played. my God. What a lineup. Yeah, and we played nothing but big arch top guitars. It was all, it, you know, Michael Amardine was out there conducting a different orchestra every night. And the music was very, like, uh, I don't know, Nat King Cole, uh, Nelson Riddle, you know, like, Thing. Nelson Riddle, he did the stuff for Bat. Didn't he do the Batman score? Uh, Nelson like did. Uh, I mean, that's a guy like Sinatra, basically. Okay. Yeah. So it was very, uh, very kind of like big band Sinatra, like the heyday of Sinatra type arrangement. Mm. Yeah. Some of the some of the solos were orchestrated three part guitar, you know, all harmonized, you know, really cool. And uh, but Vince, you know, Vince is now Amy's husband, and I've known Amy Grant, you know, thirty something years. So I see Vince all the time, and you know, and it, it, it's it, it, there's like guitar brotherhood in this town, you know. Sure. You know, like, He's like one guy I'm I'm gonna want to float one, a couple of my jazz tracks to just to see if I can get a little love from him, you know, because he's got this other thing that he does in town called the Time Jumpers. Yep. And it's, you know, you know what they're about. It's like really cool, like Western swing, a lot of a lot of Texas swing, three uh, fiddle players, and it's all swing and highly arranged, and you know, it's like country bebop you know uh, um, is there a guy named andy something in, the, in that yep, band andy reese yeah i just got referred to him i've just haven't gotten a hold of him yet i've been too busy uh, yeah I, I wasn't so tired when i got in town we got back from florida on sunday night but andy reese was playing at a, a new jazz club in town called rudy <laughs> that's cool so i want to go see him um because every time i go see the time jumpers i'm like Man, that other guy next to Vince is pretty damn good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's Andy. And that's Andy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, but Vince is like Vince is like one of these guys, you know. Uh, he's he's such a great guy and a great musician. He gives a lot to the community. He's a guitar god, you know. He's you know Clapton invites him to do the Crossroads thing every time they do one. Hmm. So. Vince is there, and um, and you know, Vin, he's like one of those superstar. And there's not that many of them in the country world who are guitar virtuosos. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, back, back not anymore. The, no, and back there's a lot of guys who are virtuosos, but like, you know, Vince is in that Glenn Campbell, you know. Uh, yep. Keith Urban, you know, he's in that upper echelon of guys who are Brad Paisley, mm -hmm. you know, guys that, you know, they're flying the guitar hero thing. They're flying the torch for that, and they keep on doing it, you know. No, but there's not a lot of them. You are 100% right. Yeah, I mean, from from Vince's era, it was him and Steve Warner, you know, like, they were the guys back then, you know. In Glenn Campbell's time, it was like him and, you know, Roy Clark and guys like that. Yeah. But very, there, there's, there seems to be like two or three every decade that shoot to like, you know, superstar status, but not that many, you know, um, uh, that that get to that you know multi platinum status like Vince has maintained, you know. He's a musician's musician, you know, and yes, every you know, if I see him, we could just quickly shoot the bull on guitar all day long. And he's just a normal guy. He goes and has breakfast at Nashville every morning, you know. Yeah, everybody tells you that. Yeah, he's he just he wakes up and goes and has breakfast every morning at Nashville. And it's no big secret, you know. What's it called? Nashville? Nashville. That's Not so Nashville. funny. Nashville. Nashville. That's so yeah. funny, man. Yeah. 
Hey, you mentioned Kenny Locke. Let's talk about Kenny. How'd you get the job with him? That, that's a probably a nice gig. Amazing. And like Peter, he's, you know, really one of my closest friends and kind of a big brother mentor. But I had, you know, this is like my life. Like, this is the kind of stuff that just lands, right? Like, I signed a publishing deal with Sony Los Angeles in 1991. Um, I had been playing some showcases in Nashville and Sony signed me, but they, they thought we ought to take you out to the West Coast office and get you signed out there. To explain to the listeners what all that means. You got you signed a publishing deal. Well, uh, I was writing songs and, uh, and performing them myself and playing, you know, out in, the club in Nashville. And I, you know, I got noticed by, by some publishers. Uh, who that's who they want to sign they want to sign performing songwriters sure who could potentially become performing artists and so um, I I had a few connections at Sony in town and then they referred me to the West Coast office who subsequently signed me to a publishing deal essentially signing me to grab my songs and then exploit them you know either I'm going to cut them myself as an artist or they're going to find other people to cut my songs. Okay. So I go out to LA and I meet, um, now you go out there to move out there permanently or just to, oh, no, just I to just sign go, the deal with them. I go out there to sign the deal and Deidre O'Hara was, she was running the company and like she'd been, she'd been at publishing at Sony for a long time. Like, she knew Marvin Gaye and people like that. She knew Miles Davis. You know, oh. she knew, basically knew everybody that was under the Sony umbrella. So she goes, hey, you know what? Why don't we go downstairs one flight down and go see Bobby Columbia at Epic Records? Right. At, well, was he at Epic? No, he would have been. So maybe he was at, you know, he was at Sony. You know, Sony had like Epic under its umbrella. There was certain there was a bunch of record labels that were under the Sony former CBS. Um, CBS became Sony, right? And then, but Bobby Columbia, who was the drummer of Blood, Sweat, and Tears, who was on Columbia with thus his association. He, you know, he had a long run with Blood, Sweat, and Tears as their drummer, and he also was an a and r man for columbia he signed jocko past stories and, and a and r's artists and repertoire artists and repertoire and yeah. and explain just to the listeners what those guys do and what the, that they're responsible for well so like they're sort of the middleman between the label and the artist like typically a label will have a roster of if it's a Sony label, you might have like 10 different A&R guys. And, you know, there may be an A&R guy for country and an A&R guy for classical music and an A&R guy for pop. Well, because of Bobby being on Columbia, which later, be, you know, was a Sony subsidiary, uh, Bobby, uh, simultaneous to having a career as a drummer for Blood, Sweat & Tears, he became a suit. He was an A and R guy, artist and and, the, and their job is really to res responsible to look for talent, correct? They look for talent, and then they also guide the talent. Once the talent is signed, they help the artist choose songs. Uh, you know, I like that song. It's a lot stronger than this other thing that you're in love with. Trust me. Let's go with this song. Okay. You know, they're that guy, and. They can also be a producer for the label, as Bobby was in bringing Jocko to Columbia, and he produced that record, the record that made Jocko world famous. Jocko Pastoria, she's talking about. Uh, Jocko. So, Deidre O'Hara, my publisher, goes, hey, let's go downstairs. Let's think the day I got signed. Hey, let's go downstairs. I want to introduce you to Bobby Columbia. And I'm like one of these guys that reads credits on every record. So I totally knew who Bobby Columbia was since I was like 11 years old. 
you know, like I, I had blood, sweat and tears records. I knew he was the drummer. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, by the time I was 16, I knew that he produced Jocko, you know, like, so here I am, I'm 31. I'm signed to Sony. I go downstairs. I meet Bobby. And, uh, I had a DAT tape. That's like, that was like the, you know, now everybody just puts stuff on a CD or like sends files and Dropbox, you know. Back then, that was the format for like carrying your songs around. So she brought a DAT tape down to the meeting of my songs that basically got me signed. Hey, Chris, meet Bobby. I shake his hand. We're in his office. Bobby, check out some of this guy's songs. So he puts the thing on. And after three or four or five minutes of listening to it, he lowers the volume and he goes, so these are your songs. And I went, yeah. He goes, is that you playing guitar? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, would you like a job with Kenny Loggins? And I went, yeah. <laughs> Holy crap. This is all like, and what's going, was, through, what's going through your head? It's just like, like our guy. what's that? He was Kenny's A&R guy. Oh, okay. At Columbia. So, like, talk about a jackpot day, you know, like, yeah, like, where the stars aligned and it was all, you know, like, ding, 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 you know, it's like winning a payday in Vegas or something, you know, it was like, and I was like very calm. I was like, I knew what was happening, you know. So he calls Kenny's manager who calls Kenny. And I'm going to be in L.A. for like a week, right? And I'm still at this point with Amy Grant, kind of like, right. kind of mainly still in her camp as a touring guitarist. And I'm assuming she knew you were going out to sign this deal. No, I don't think I, I don't think I, she might have known, you know, it wasn't like I was, you know, at this point in her career, she's like one of the top five female stars in the world right so you know she she had tons of stuff on her you know going on okay i get it so like your you signing this was not an impact on her one little bit everybody is you know as long as you made the times that you're supposed to be there you, you're you you know you're good it's not like you're yeah, working I think yeah it was like one month where we just weren't working okay you know? gotcha so i go out to la i meet bobby he's like you want to be in kenny's <laughs> And I'm like, yes, you know, like, and I'm, you know, I, thinking like at some point I'll probably have to tell, you know, this could be a conflict with Amy, but like, you know, Kenny's a big hero of mine. You sure. Know? Also, to be fair, the Amy Grant tour, we, we pretty much had winded down. We, okay. we were, we were pretty much done. Uh, you know, that, you know, it was going to be maybe a, you know, a handful of like, private gigs or something you know so like we were we were kind of done so i'm already out in la and uh i get a rent a car i drive up to carpinteria which is basically santa barbara and i go to kenny's house and kenny's not there he's not back from working out all right so i sit there for like 30 minutes <laughs> oh my god longest 30 minutes of my life and he walks in, he's wearing sweats, he's got long hair, it's up in a man bun, you know, no big deal. Hey man, give me give me five minutes, I'm gonna pop in the shower. Yeah. You know, so my my weight got even longer. Yeah. Then he comes out and we pull out two acoustic guitars and we just start jamming. And he hears me sing and he knows I got a high falsetto. You're in. That wow. Okay. Two weeks later is my first gig with him. No rehearsal with the band. Zero. How did, so you had two weeks to learn his songs. Like yeah, and I for some reason I went home. I don't think I even had two weeks. I think I had like a week. It was a private gig in Park City, Utah. Right. That's it's like, in Salt Lake, right? Yeah. Yeah. For like three hundred and fifty celebrities. Like 
and no rehearsal with the band. So like they had sent me dat tapes with the band on the right side and my isolated part that I'm supposed to learn from the guitar player who had left the gig, Guy Thomas. So if if I, I if I just took one headphone off, I could hear Guy Thomas on vocals and guitar on the left side. That's the part I'm supposed to learn. Bands on the right, and I did that for twenty three or twenty four songs. Okay, wow. <laughs> and just absolutely did my homework. And I walk in to do the gig, and I'm meeting some very big wig players. Steve George is on keyboards. Steve George was half of the band Mr. Mr. Like, okay. I knew who Steve George was. Freddie Washington was on bass. Well, Freddie, I, you know, Freddie, you know, I knew about Freddie from Herbie Hancock. Um, he played on Patrice Russian's Forget Me Nots. Um, legendary, you know. I, I basically knew... And Mark Russo on saxophone, he played it with the yellow jackets. You know, these were like heavy ass people, right? Mm -hmm. So to say I'm nervous is an understatement, you know, but I had done my homework. So we do the gig, like, I don't know who's in the crowd. The curtain opens because it's at a large restaurant is where the gig was, mm -hmm. right? Right on the main strip of Park City, which is now where they do the Sundance Festival, right? Cool. Uh, and you know what? It it was Sundance Week. We were there during the Sundance Festival. And the curtain goes up, and there's like hauling up sitting. Holy yeah. crap! Uh, Bernard Shaw, who was like. An announce, uh, uh, an anchor for yeah, CNN. Yeah, why do I? Yeah, right, right, right. Bernard Shaw, sure. right, right. It was like that. Like everybody there was a luminary, famous person. And I guess I did good because not only did Kenny pay me great for the show, but he, you know, uh, bonus me like five hundred bucks. Hey, double down if you come out tomorrow, right? Something like that. Yeah, and and here I am, twenty six years later. You he, know. That's amazing. How, how long did you play with Kenny for? Well, it's been on and off for 25 years. Oh, so you've been playing with him the whole time? I thought you were. So is that how you met Shem? That's how I met Shem. Because he's the MD there, wasn't he? Or Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. I, I was in the band before Shem. You know, I was right. Maybe a year or two before Shem got in there. And... Uh, and the guy who now does the gig, Scott Bernard, who's an incredible player... Uh, I recommended him, you know, um, I probably recommended six musicians that, you know, six musicians to Kenny that he's used in the last 15 years. Um, he's, he's gone. He's got a, a lot of Nashville people that have been in his camp, um, including uh, Gene Miller, which is how I got the Sutera gig. You know, I recommended Gene to Kenny and Gene recommended me to Sutera. So, you know, it's like, we're all sort of, you know, patting each other on the back and doing the alley-oop, you know, and throwing each other gigs. You but, know? you know, Nat, I don't know. I think it's the music business in general. It seems like once you're in, you know, and once, you know, whatever it is you do and you're in there, uh, people are very comfortable endorsing you. That's the way it seems anyway. Because I hear this very consistently across like every musician I interview. Well, it's 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 kind of like this thing where like if you've got the goods and you're a reliable player, and and also you know there's if you've got the road etiquette, as it were, uh, you know there, there's definitely a list of unwritten rules. You know, by the time I got Kenny's gig. I had I'd done three or four world world tours, not in the pop world, but uh, in the Christian world with Amy Grant, and you know Amy was a big pop star at, the, at this at this juncture. So it's like um, I I knew 
I knew the game. I knew I knew what to do, what not to do, how to behave on the road. You know, I I knew I knew the ins and outs of road life, and um, so I, I you know I, I I guess I could you I I was a seasoned veteran sure. at that point. You know, well to Na- I think Nashville training. It seems like the professionalism level is pretty freaking high. It's it's definitely become you know we used to be called the third coast, right? It was always New yeah. York, <laughs> yeah, LA. New York, LA. But Nashville's got a deep a talent pool as those cities. A- absolutely, and, and the prof- like I said, the professionalism is super high there. I mean, at least. I don't know. I haven't spoke to tons of younger cats, but like guys our age, everybody's like very professional and very you know they know when to, you know when to have fun, but they know when to be serious. You know, like even yeah. like even things like when I first started doing this podcast, Chris. To be honest with you, I figured you know I'd make appointments because I didn't know, and everybody'd be late. I don't think out of maybe close to 200 interviews I've done, I think maybe one person's been late. I mean, it's, I mean, cause everybody's like, you know, they're very well trained. You know, I got to be at my gig or at a session at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock or two o'clock or five, I'm going to be there. And it, you know, so everybody's like, those are really good habits though, in general, in life, you know? Well, if punctuality and just, you know, if, if it's a 10 o'clock downbeat at a session, and you're just getting there tuning your stuff. It's like everybody else is waiting on you. Like that's a surefire way, you know, never to get hired again. <laughs> yeah. And in, in a competitive world like like it is here with an ever sh- shifting, you know, group of producers and writers and you know like to stay in the game a long time, you know, you you just got to do consistency is the key, you know. That that's like number one rule like and i mean talent you got to have but you got to have all these other things as well you know just etiquette promptness uh suggestions you know at a session you know there's when to speak up when to shut up you know like there's always it's just little stuff i've kind of learned you know i'm i I learned the hard way. There were probably things that I was on and never got hired again because I just didn't have the right stuff or or the tools at the time. But, you know, over the decades, I've been able to sort of surmise what, what works and what doesn't, you know. Well, you know that the number one thing is, and I don't think – I'm coming on the – I'm coming from everything from the business end. So my vantage point is just a little different. But you're in the service business. Absolutely. And the guys that know how to provide good service and, you know, the old cliche, service with a smile, who the hell doesn't – you love those guys. You work with them all the time. Who doesn't want to work with someone that does that? Because that's a – you know, I don't know what your world is like, but, you know, mediocrity is the new excellent, man, for the service business, at least down here in Florida, man. You know, if somebody shows up on time, that's a miracle. That's not like – you know, that's not like to be expected. My friend Mike Brignadello, who's a legendary bass. I know player, Mike, great guy. Great guy, but he calls us day laborers, and we are. In a sense, we build, we build musical houses. We show up. Yes. It's just like it's just like we're showing up and putting siding up on the wall, except it's for songs. Yes, that's a you know, and and I it I don't I understand what he's saying. That that doesn't give you guys enough credit. But yeah, I get it. Yeah, I totally get it. I mean, it. It, it's a little understated, and he's yeah, you know, he's making a, he's being a self-deprecating. <laughs> yeah, it, but tongue but in cheek. Really, at the end of the day, that's really what we do. Yes. You know, yes. There's, you know, um, m- maybe there was a period in time where it, there was a little more glory to it. You know, uh, back. Back in the '90s, when they were printing money in this town, you know, but like right now, everybody's doing the hustle. Sure. So it's pretty much uh, 
it's pretty much a blank slate. You know, it's you 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 got to just show up for the gig as if it was the first session you were ever going to do. You know. Yeah. I've got two tomorrow. I'm doing a ten and a two, and you know, I uh, I got to be ready at ten a.m. to strum an acoustic guitar, be in tune, and be ready. You know, and then bolt across town and play electric all day. You know, so it's like, um, and I don't take it for granted at all. Sure, I am not. It's not anything that's owed to me. Every single gig that comes around you know we're 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 all on the hunt you know we're all hungry to- totally get it man but yeah. i but i think those the the guys that do those things that provide the service and are humble like i haven't met and i'm not just saying this for to like humor you i literally and now i'm in a different capacity i'm not working in the studio with these guys i hate I haven't out of 200 musicians I've and I've interviewed all over the country maybe half at least in Nashville maybe two thirds man I've met two or three guys that have been kind of egotistical that's it that's a pretty low percentage and they haven't been like assholes they just you could tell the like okay this guy's a little in love with himself but I think that's a great percentage man like that's what you know less that's around you know one and a half percent that's pretty good well, you know, I think we've all learned that the music business is not, you know, what it used to be. And being humble is a good thing. Having humility is a good thing. Not only is it a good thing for you as a person, it's good for your music. It's good for your playing, you know. If I thought I was, you know, if I thought I was the deal on everything, I wouldn't learn anything. Right. You know. So I'm constantly on YouTube looking up Scott Henderson and Pat Metheny and uh, John McLaughlin. And, you know, they're all they're all doing Robin Ford. They're all doing clips on YouTube. That is my guitar teacher. Sure. I go there at least once a day just to, like, get a nugget of wisdom, you know, and learn something new because. When you think you got, when you think you know it, you don't, you know, and, but it's probably the reason why I'm having the best time of my career right now. Like I, I feel like I'm 15 and I'm learning stuff every day and it's really fun. It's awesome, man. It really is. I mean, there, there's nothing like going out and playing live. That that's immediate gratification. You have an audience right there in front of you giving it back. It's different from a studio, which is, you know, the only immediate gratification you're gonna get is if the producer looks at you and goes, Yeah, I like what I'm hearing, you know. That that that's it. You just get you're there for that one that one person or the artist, you know. But you're well, you're there for you show the, up though, Chris. I mean, like mentally, I mean, I don't know you real well, but we've talked, you know, a few hours at this point. I mean, you, you, you're, you show up, you're there, you're present. It's, you're not you like, gotta be yeah, yeah. You, you know, you're not like, you know, oh, another fucking gig, you know, I mean, you're, yeah, you know, I, I, I enjoyed that about you. It was like clear and that your, your enthusiasm for what you're doing is, is genuine, you know? And you're happy to be doing it. You're grateful, like you said, and you provide the service. And dude, I've been wanting to do this since I was five. You know, like I'm living the childhood dream every day. You right. know what I mean? Sure. This is like this is something I wanted to do as soon as I could remember stuff. You know. Sure. From the from the pretty much from the time that I have memory. You know, it was like. You know, initially, I, my mom and dad had all these like Broadway musical uh, albums in the house. So I wanted to be Robert Goulet, man. I, I wanted to like sing. Robert you know, Goulet, man, you're taking me back with all these names on this call. Yeah. Like I wanted to sing in Camelot or West Side Story or like Fiddler on the Roof or like th- I'm trying to think of the big 60s soundtrack records of the day. Perry Como. All that. Yeah. And then in first grade, I met a, uh, this kid, Steven Suglia, 
And he's like, hey, come on up to my apartment after school. You got to hear the Beatles. And that was it. Like, that was like my life changed. You know, I'm in first grade. And I'm like, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. You know, it was that. Never had a plan B. Never made a contingent a contingency plan you know it was always about maintaining a life in music you know so and now at, you know it's a dream i'm living a childhood dream Every day. let me ask you this when when you first got out of school and you first started playing professionally in nashville What were some of the bigger surprises for you? Like things you weren't expecting or you didn't know. It doesn't have to be bad, but just things that were like, oh, okay, I got to make sure I, this is, I, I didn't learn this in, in business class in Belmont. Hmm. That's a good question. I was, I, I don't want to say I wasn't, wasn't surprised by much, but I definitely, I was definitely ready for stuff. Um, like, and I don't, I think it was because I had a really good teacher at the college I went to. Mm -hmm. He was like, he was like, man, I'm not worried about you as a player. You're going to make it. Which was incredible for me to hear from my teacher. You know, like, I hadn't done anything anything yet in my career at that point you know but he was like i'm not worried about you as a player you're gonna make it uh my job here in, in the next four years that you're at school is to give you as many tools so you can go out and make a living i'm gonna teach you a bunch of stuff you don't know you know and by the way do you own a tuxedo <laughs> okay. yeah doesn't every 18 year old <laughs> of course <laughs> and i'm like no, I don't have a tuxedo. Why? He goes, because there's some gigs that I can't do and don't want to do, but I, I think you'd be good to do them. Oh, wow. So, like, I'm in college with my teacher, and he's throwing me work, right? So I go and buy a tuxedo, and I show up at a gig, and it's like, the first song is Misty. Yeah. Wow. The second song is Take the A Train. So it was a jazz gig. Do -do -do -do. Kind of, but by the second set, you're playing Long Train Running by the Doobie Brothers. Oh, wow. What a cool gig. Yeah, and it's 1979, 1980, so there's some disco involved. You know, I'm having to play Hot Stuff and, you know, Last Dance by Donna Summer. It's like, it, you know, the first set is light and kind of jazzy, and the, the second set is like, oh, and you sing? Can you sing China Grove? Yeah. You know, it was like that. Man, you are, I, I can't, man, I really regret not seeing you play now because, you, you know, you've, uh, you're obviously a badass because you've done all this stuff and, and all these people like, you know, snag you. Man, I'm so sorry. Like we drove two hours. I, I guess, <laughs> Dude, don't worry. I, <laughs> don't, listen, man, that's the last thing. I wasn't on, I, hey, it's my fault because I should have thought, I just, I'm sitting there thinking, Oh, I guess he just came for one gig in Naples and he's going back. I, I should, you know, it should have been me thinking, well, where else is he playing? So don't worry about it. I'll see you. I will see you play for sure this year, 100%. Whether it's here, man, or I'll be in Nashville in the summer. I'll, I'll just, you know, we'll hang somewhere and, you know, we'll, I'll, I'll, we'll play together or something like that. Or, or I could watch you play and pretend I could pretend to play. Not um, to make you feel bad, but we had a killer gig in Sarasota. Man, oh, I'm it was, sure. It was killer. Well, we were all sweating it because we hadn't played together in seven weeks. And, you know, for us, that's kind of a, a lengthy period of time. And, we, you know, we didn't have a rehearsal. So it was like we had a long sound check. And it was like, okay, you know, because it's Peter's music is, you know, there's – some of that David Foster stuff, there's a chord on every beat, hmm. you know, it's like stuff keeps, keeps moving, you know, I love three chord rock, but that ain't, you know, it's not that. 
Well, not Chicago. It's too, you're not going to find that in, too much of that in Chicago music. You might get that in a song or two, but that's about it if you're lucky. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I like playing. You know, I like playing Cinnamon Girl and stuff like that. But there's a lot more chord changes. You know? Yeah, sure. So, um, isn't it? Was that at the new? Th- is that place new? No, we played. Uh, so we played this place called Van Weasel. I played there with Kenny, like I don't know, fourteen, fifteen years ago. Okay, I thought it was new. Been there before. It's 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 uh, it's well, been there a while. Okay. It's, it's it's a nice kind of you know it's a performing arts center. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. So I don't know if you answered that question. Things that were surprising you. Well. You know, I think by so by the time I got out of school, because my guitar teacher, who let me tell you, I mean, like three days ago, I, I, I sent him text messages like every couple, three months, like, John Pell, thank you for being you and for teaching me some stuff. That's you know, cool, man. Like, He's probably thrilled to get that because he don't get that from guys like you that are so far out of it at this point. Yeah, I mean, we're still really good friends. I mean, we're friends. And like, I... I try to like, I try to see him, you know, I try to have dinner with him at least once a year, you know, um, he, uh, God, I want to say he played classical, you know, he played classical guitar at my wedding 20, 30 years ago. Oh, know? wow. That's really just cool. A, just a great friend. But in answer to your question, I, I think I was ready for some surprises. I mean, there's things that, you know, happen that you got to, like, learn. Um, but he had given me such a head start by just throwing me gigs. And, like, and I, you know, I got thrown into some pretty deep water because I was like, I've never played Misty before, you know. But I had a real book, you know, full of all the standards. Hmm. And I was already, in, you know, I was learning jazz at school. So, but it was like my first time. Like, you mean I'm going to drive to Clarksville, Tennessee, which is 40 minutes away, and make 125 bucks in a night? Yeah, that must have been big time. Yeah, for 20 years old. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, so it cost me 100 dollars to buy a tux. That was my investment. So first gigs, first gigs. Yeah, on of the course. Phone, right? Yeah, of course. That's no big deal. I probably did. In college, I probably did about forty of these suckers. Good for you, before, man. Before yeah, I graduated, so that's why you had such good training. Yeah, and then you're like, yeah. you're just ready. You know, you just end up being ready. You know, people walk up to the bandstand and start requesting songs. Do you know it? You know, and your brain goes, no, but you absolutely say yes. You know. And you're looking at all these people, and sometimes it's people that you're meeting for the first time. You know, I, it wasn't the same band every night. Sometimes I'd go out there, and it's like, "Hi, I'm Chris. I play guitar. Hi, I'm Joe Blow. I play bass. Let's play a three-hour gig." Right. You know, it's like that. So there, that's baptism by fire. So what? That's really great training, though, man. Tremendous training. It is because you got to yeah. learn how to make music with strangers. Which you is, know, which, yeah. so there's like this basic set of unwritten rules in this language you know and um so by the time i kind of got you know dan and this is where dan huff you know dan huff is so key in my life he he's recommended me several times for things that ended up being like humongous things for me like if you could go back because you've been doing this a long time and it sounds like you really I mean, I know you said you probably lost a couple of gigs, but I think you would chalk that up to a, in, appropriate immaturity or a, a, a inexperience, probably a better word, for that point in time in your life. So not a big deal. It doesn't sound like you've beaten yourself up about it because everybody does stuff like that. But if you can go back and give your younger self, little Chris Rodriguez or middle Chris Rodriguez, advice, what advice would you have given yourself? Wow, great question. I think. Thanks. Glad you. I think I would have. I, I first of all, I would have said, uh, "Get your head out of your ass," 
and and pay a little more attention to everybody else. Um, you're not the center of the world. And listen more. Like, just listen more. You know, I... I, I think I have a reputation as a nice guy. I'm easy going, you know, but like maybe I just thought I was, I don't think people thought I was conceited, but I might've been, I might've thought I was cool, you know, which, you know, that's just, maybe that's just being young, you know? Yeah, I think so. You're young and you don't know better. You know, you don't, you know, Whatever humility I have now, I kind of gained over the years. You know, you, you you win a few, you lose a few. You 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 get up the ladder and then you get knocked down a notch. You know, so it's like I think I would just probably would have been like, just you know, suck it up and 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 just start listening a little more. You know. You mean listening to music or listening to other people or listening to smarter people than you or listening to smarter people. It's not just the music. It's not listening. I've always been a good listener to music, but just listen more. You know, okay. you're not the wisest 27 year old that ever walked the planet. You know, you know, you're you're on top of the world now because you're young but you know that that doesn't last every day start you know quit talking and be more of a listener okay so let me ask you this question cuz this is kind of related to that mm-hmm. uh, you mentioned earlier that you had a couple of guys that were your mentors i think you said one of them was kind of dan huff one of them was your teacher and I think you said musically one of them was Gordon Kennedy. Yeah, I mean, they're all, you know, they're all guys that have been sort of in my life for a long time. I mean, uh, guys like Dan and Gordon, are, they're kind of more my peers, but they really are my mentors, too. You know, I, it's because of Dan Huff that I met Michael W. Smith. It's because of Dan Huff that I got recommended to sing on faith hill it's because of dan huff that i sang on lone star it's because of dan huff that i'm on megadeth records you know like talk about one guy that opened up like a gazillion doors for me yeah um i I could and but i could say the same about kenny Loggins. you know i went and did this record in the early 90s called um outside from the redwoods it was a live record that record came out, man, and and all of a sudden I had a whole lot more respect in Nashville, and I I had already sung on a few hundred records by that point, but because of because it was Kenny, you know, it was like that was like that had a lot of weight, you know. Um, I mean, he's always been a mentor. The way Satara is to me now is is a mentor, you know. So let me let me ask you this then. When you were younger, when you said listen more to other people, do you think you should have like solicited more advice? Were you that guy that was okay getting advice from people? I was okay with getting advice, but I was a little uppity about it. Okay. You know, like I was a little, you know, there was and maybe this might have been more on the business side than the music side Hmm. you know um there were probably certain business things that i could have done better you know um had i listened to you know wiser counsel right you know um but then again you know like i always thought the music business was a very dubious business you know like um I had been offered record deals probably since 1986, 1987 in the gospel Christian music world. And I turned them all down until 1999 when I signed to Word. Basically because I just kind of felt like 
I would be off in this one world over here on the left and ignore the bigger world, you know, the pop, the pop rock world. Y- and then, yeah, but that sounds pretty reasonable. That doesn't sound like uh, bad judgment because there is no. a chance of that happening. Yeah, especially at a young age. I I think that was one example where I actually made the right decision because, let's face it, even in Christian music, you sign to a record deal, the audiences are a bit more loyal in that world, but it's still like, you know, the label's going to try to turn its roster over every five to ten years, you Mm -hmm. know? You become old news. So the fact that I stayed kind of an independent, you know, hired gun has probably kept me in the business longer. Like, Yeah, you stayed I, relevant I, more. Yeah, I think I've had more longevity as a hired independent gun than, than if I'd have put all my eggs in that one basket. Because, you know, that inevitably, unless you're one of the rare 5%, you know, that can last for a long time, you're going to you're gonna be booted off the label. And then what? You know, I had the fortunate or in the foresight to, to want to be a hired gun because I can just stay independent and keep changing and moving. You know, like, okay, since Keith Urban, now I play, you know, mandolin and banjo. You know, I've added that to my thing. And so you, do you what? still play with Keith on the road? No, no, I haven't been with Keith since 2010, but I had to learn how to play some of what they call utility instruments. Right, you know, right. Extra stuff. So, which has been, you know, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, I got to bring those with me to the session. You know, it's just a few more things that I've added. Right, you right. Know, well, I think if I had just been an artist, I, I might not have grown musically, I guess is what I'm saying. I might have just... I feel like I could have become a slave to the music machine, you know. Sure. Without, uh, without, pardon me, without growing. So, um, so where do you think you you would have had better business decision making? Because it sounds like it worked out. It worked out, but you know, like I don't know. There's there's certain things. Um, I, I don't have any regrets. You know, there yeah. were a couple of, you know couple opportunities i missed out on you know but like i became a family man so i you know that became my priority sure I, when i first got the gig with shania twain i was with her for about a year and we did not go on the road all we did was tv shows she was selling a million records a month by not touring wow how- J- just by going on tv just by putting out these videos and she became this phenom, phenom, you know, she was like YouTube, like a YouTube phenom before that was everybody was a YouTube phenom. Well, it's, you know, at this point, it's MTV and VH1. I mean, she's a she, you know, she's a beautiful woman. Yes. Very sexy, beautiful. Did, you know, at, when, at the time they called them, you know, racy or provocative videos. They look awful tame to me now. Yeah, yeah, you know? for sure. But but certainly in the country world. She was kind of reinventing the rules for women in country the way Garth was reinventing it for dudes, you know. Yeah. In the 90s. So, and because the videos were so popular, she sold a million records a month. And all we did was go on Jay Leno, David Letterman, the American Music Awards, the Grammys, Billboard Awards. You know, it was all TV. What was the coolest of those shows that you've done? Uh, of of stuff with Shania. Yeah, uh, just TV shows in general. I mean, you've you've ran the circuit multiple times. I'm sure. Okay. I gotta say, I I with, when I was with Keith Urban, this was in 2005. We played an event called Live Eight. Live All, Eight, uh, the number eight. Yeah, okay. Eight, because it was. Live eight because it was eight different territories across the world, also chaired by Bob Gildor. Okay, so, so it's like Live Aid but different. 
Yeah, not okay. li- not Live Eight. They called it Live Eight. Yeah. Oh, I get because you. it was eight different cities across the globe. Right. Getcha. So we were in Philadelphia. There was one in London. There was one in Berlin. There, were, you know, they pick the eight biggest cities in the world. They were having simultaneous concerts all day. Right. So in Philadelphia, I'm playing with Keith, but like, it was Lincoln Park. Def Leppard, Stevie Wonder, Maroon 5, you know, that was just in our town. Right. In Philly. We get on stage, and there's 300,000 people in front of me. And where, you mean like on the TV or like? Like, yeah, I mean, this was a live, live televised. crap. Festival. Yeah, I mean, this, we played in Philadelphia. Okay, the stage was set up. You know the stairs that that Sylvester Stallone runs up in yeah, Rocky? I sure do. Yeah, we were set up there. Wow. And we played down the length of a mall, uh, Grass Mall, and kind of like as long as it is in like Washington, D.C., between, you know, like... Uh, uh, like the Washington Monument and the, the end yeah, of the lake like there. Yeah, like the Jefferson Memorial and yeah. Congress is two miles long. It was like that long. You know, it was just full of people. And I, you know, I played the Grammys three times. American Music Awards, I played three or four times. I've been on Jay Leno fourteen times. Holy crap! I played David Letterman three times. Conan O'Brien, I played three or four times. They're all huge, okay? Like it, it's all big stuff. But that one event with Keith. I, I kind of have to call it the biggest deal because it was being televised across the globe and it was, you know, it was a world event. I mean, it was, it was a world event. I would say of all the, the things I've done and it was really poignant for me because, you know, my dad was dying and I didn't know if I was even going to be able to go up and make that show. I'm um, sorry about that, man. I didn't know that. Yeah, and he took a turn for the better. I mean, he passed away a few months after that. But, like, going up there, I wasn't quite sure if I was going to even be able to go, you know. But then he took a turn for the better, so, I, you know, I made it. I made the gig. But, like, if you see the footage, if I see the footage now, you could, you could see the stress on my face. Is, is, the, is that on YouTube anywhere? Oh, yeah. So, Look up. what, Keith Urban, Live 8? Live Eight, and we played somebody, uh, somebody like you, which is like th- one of his biggest hits that he's ever had. Um, we actually played a, th- you know, everybody did a mini set. You know, no, nobody did more than three or four or five songs. With Keith, we did like fifteen minutes, so we did three songs, and um, but, and I own the box set. I got it up in my music. I've got the DVDs. You know. I'm, Look up Keith Urban Live Eight. Yeah, it's all over Philadelphia. YouTube. There's a bunch of them. There's, there's a bunch. Yeah, of you'll them. see. Me. I got like a, I got more of a pro, you know, than I do now. Uh, wow. Yeah. Um, interesting, man. So you, you, I don't. So uh, it's interesting that you said you'd listen more because you've. It seems like everything has, you know. I mean, everybody makes mistakes, of course, but it, it seems like you've really. W- one thing we haven't talked, let's talk about your work ethic because all this shit is happening because of that. And Mm -hmm. I mean, period, you know, your talent and your work ethic, that's what's making all of this happen. I mean, you've played and had like very long-term stints with some major, I mean, every name I read off here is a major artist. This is rare that you've had long, I mean, you've been Kenny Loggins for years. You've been with, um, uh, Peter Cetera for years. I mean, you've had long stints with these people. That doesn't happen because you know, you know, you you, you just happen to be available at the time. You know, nobody else was. What talk about your work ethic? Well, I mean, I love my job. You know, I don't I don't take that for granted. I just love the fact that I can wake up, breathe, and uh, play guitar and. And also, I get to write stuff. You know, Rodney Crowell, he 
he said he gets to wake up and make up shit, you know, like that's amazing. You know, you start the day with a blank slate and 30 minutes later you got a song, you know, and I, 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 I guess I just genuinely love my job and I love music so much that I can't help but have a good work ethic. But I, I, I had a good work, that work ethic as a kid. And I'm really thankful for the parents that I have. Yeah, you know, where, my, where did you get that from? Let's talk, yeah, that's what... Well, my dad was like... My dad never really made any money in his life. But I went to private school every year. And I always had good clothes. Uh, he was a dapper guy. You know, he had, he just got up and got it done. Same with my mom. You know, so if I have any kind of work ethic, it's because I saw what they were doing, you know, and how they made, how they made so much out of so little, you know. What, and What kind of work did they do? So my dad was in retail his whole life. You know, he worked in clothes, shoes. Um, there were there was a few years where he was an executive doing the same thing, an executive for the company. But basically, man, he was a day laborer, you mm -hmm. know, like he worked in retail. Yeah. And um, and then he retired at 66. And a month later, he found out he had cancer. So he never... Mm you know, never got to enjoy his retirement, you know, but my dad was one of the happiest men in the, that ever walked the planet. You know, everybody loved my dad. When he died, there were 350 people at the funeral, like, you know, wow. for, uh, you know, like everybody loved him. He was a lovable guy and, uh, he sure loved music. You know, like I found out about earth, wind and fire cause he turned me on to it, you know, he gave me Led Zeppelin four. Oh, that's cool, man. He's like, you need to listen to this, you know, and it's, you know, he bought me Chicago five, which got me into Chicago, you know, like he was a music lover and, you know, he grew up in the era of doo-wop. So that in the late fifties, that hmm. was his, you know, but he worked hard and so did my mom. What did your mom do? My mom was a stay-at-home mom until my teens. Uh, well, actually, when when she was when I was nine, she went to work for American Airlines. And between the age of nine and fourteen, we went everywhere for nothing. That's cool. Just, Did she work at the airport, or she worked downtown at the at the American Airlines she, building? She worked downtown in Manhattan as a key punch operator. Wow! And so she did not work at the airport, but she. That's the and big was, bi that that was the old Pan Am building, right? Right in Grand Central. Correct. She yeah. In the yeah. Old Pan Am building. Yeah. And because she worked for the airlines, we could fly to Puerto Rico for, you know, a family of four for like 75 bucks. Oh, that's awesome, man. It's that kind of thing, you know, we we, we So you made they made good it sounds like they worked really hard to make fun with the what they had instead of like bitching about what they didn't have. They just enjoy their life, which is like really healthy. Really healthy. I had probably one of the greatest childhoods that a musician can have. And I had the total support of both my mom and dad. Like, you know, that strat that my dad bought me when I was 14, even back in 1974, that thing must have cost them four or five hundred bucks. Right. And for me, I'm, I know that was a two weeks salary like for him to bust out that kind of money yeah you know uh, uh, in and in that you know in 1974 money that was a bunch of money yeah but bro i you made him so proud look what you did so yeah. um, believe me i'm sure that that i mean you're a dad you know what it's like you know that i'm sure he had nothing but you know uh, a lot of pride you know with what you did with that but we were buddies. He's like, hey, man, you got to check out this song. I heard this song on the radio. I think it's the greatest thing I've ever heard. I'm like, what song is it? And he's like, it's called Carry On My Wayward Son by Kansas. <laughs> That's so cool, man. And he's like, the guitar stuff is, you know, is ridiculous. You know, he was that kind of a dad. He was just like, Earth, Wind & Fire was like his 
that's the greatest you know that was like his greatest thing like he loved them you know like you know if it had horns and it was funky and my dad was into it you know but he was also in the Led Zeppelin so it's kind of like this crazy like you know he, he was into Led Zeppelin you know as a side career my dad taught med- meditation oh shit that's awesome so, yeah, he, so, so he was probably very chilled out as a human being. He was a very advanced guy. You know, he was kind of this Buddha cat. You know, like, we all grew up Catholic, and we all went to Catholic church. But I guess there was something missing for them. You know, we, we, lo- we lost a member of our immediate family. My brother died in his sleep. I was six. Wow. And there, was another, there was another brother who was three and then my brother ricky who passed away and he was two sorry man wow that's from 1966 to 69 those were really dark years for my parents yeah uh because of the loss of a child but my dad he was the one that said maria you know let's get let's get you back in the workplace and she went back to america she you know she worked for american airlines it got her out of her funk right yeah and and be, I guess because of the loss of the child and what they were trying to like, you know, fix themselves, um, he he got involved with meditation. Well, he loved it so much he started teaching it on the side when he wasn't working. So, just as like right? a passion hobby of his. Yeah, That's and great. so he's imparting some of that wisdom onto me as a ten-year-old. I'm learning some very deep things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like, my mom and dad were like hippies, but without the drugs. Right, you know? right. That's really cool. Totally and, cool, man. And they were of that hippie counterculture time. They just didn't do the drugs. Right. You know, and they went off into the meditation thing. And it's kind of like, you know, I think about my dad all the time because, like, he was just this hip guy who was uh, loved life and and worked really hard and uh, if i got any work ethic it primarily starts with him yeah man thank yeah. you for sharing that and i'm sorry about um you know, your brother and your dad well yeah i mean every family ends up having some loss like that you know i'm really lucky i have my 79 year old mom is still with me and she lives right across town she's oh she's drive. Oh, that's cool. She's down there in Nashville with you. Awesome. Yeah, and she's the happiest, most fulfilled person. Even with all the loss in her life, she is a that that woman is smiling all the time. You know. And where's your other brother? Is he down there? Is he up in New York or in my or in uh, Hallandale? Oh, my whole immediate family is here. My oh, two brothers and my cool. sister. Very cool, you know, man. I'm, I'm the oldest of five kids. That's great. Uh, and one one of the kids we lost back back in the '60s, but um, so you know I had really proud parents. They're they're still proud. You know I I played the CMA Country Christmas Show that aired this Christmas season, and my mom was you know I was on the road with Loggins, and she's like I'm watching you on TV right now. You know like <laughs> like it's the same thing that's always been. You know if I'm on TV, she's going to be watching. That's cool, man. Yeah. And, and we're super tight. I'm going to ask you one more question, man. And I, you know, we could literally talk and hang for hours, man. And uh, when I come to Nashville, we would definitely have to do that, and maybe bring some alcohol in the equation to solve the world's pro- <laughs> problems. <laughs> but right what's in the last ten years? What's been the biggest change in your personality? Wow. Well. So I would say it's the realization that I'm not getting any younger, right? Like, so when you're young, you've got youth on your side. You can stay up later. You can party harder, you know. And now it's more like now it's time to take care of the body, you know. And uh, so, you know, I've been a really heavy practitioner of yoga now for like seven or eight months, which is like really helping me with strength 
and core and my my core and stuff. Hmm. It's just taking taking better care of the body. Good. I think that's the biggest the biggest switch for me. But also like I'm a bit more thankful too. I'm I'm I I seem to be at a place where I'm sort of taking things into account and uh speaking gratitude in the morning when I get up like damn man I get to get up and play guitar today. Mm. Like there's a lot of doctors and stuff like they want my job. You know? <laughs> I'd like their salary. You know? <laughs> I know but they'd like your job. Very good they point. They want man. my job. Yeah. You know, neurosurgeons and lawyers and and CEOs of companies, you know. Uh, and and probably some of those guys are miserable, you know. But maybe it was something that they got hammered into doing because it was something they inherited as a career, and they're unhappy, you know. Like me, I'm content, you know. I get to do exactly what I wanted to do when I was five years old, you know, at 58. That's awesome, man. And I think it's keeping me young, you know, whatever... Whatever youth I still have, it's because because of the gig I have. You know, it yep. motivates it motivates me to like stay healthy and you know, I'm I'm ten pounds heavier than I was with Keith Urban, but basically I've been the same weight since I was twenty five. That's you know? good, man. So it's like, but the fifties hit, and I got those ten pounds of being fifty. You know. <laughs> But uh, overall, that's 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 the answer, you know. They're just more gratitude, more appreciation, and uh, more respect for the time that you have here. Yeah, and it's like so, you know. I wake up and I go, all right. So what's my gig today, God? You know, like what's my gig? You know, what do you got for me? What what am I supposed to do today? What's what's in the cards? What what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to get done? You know, like there's a song to write, there's a session to play, there's some artist or songwriter who needs my service. So like I'm in the service industry, you know. Right. So I'm here to serve. You know, like there was a time when I was probably feeling kind of rock star like Hey, somebody wait on me hand and foot, you know, but it's not like that anymore. It's been, it's, I, I'm, I, I'm not any less confident in my abilities. I'm not any less of a player. I'm, I'm, I'm playing and singing as good as I've ever done. You know, obviously but, you're booked the back wall to wall and you're touring with some major people. So that's, that's clear. The marketplace has spoken on that. Well, I mean, and it's no small thing to get a call, you know, from Kenny or Peter Cetera. I, I go on the road with Brooks and Dunn. I love going out with them, you know. You know, I, when the Keith Urban gig went away, I thought life was over for me, you know, like. And since then, I've been on the road with Leanne Rimes, Kelly Clarkson, Faith Hill, Brooks and Dunn, Cetera, back with Loggins. Like, it all kept going. You know, it did. It didn't stop. You know. Well, well, we'll be having this conversation in two or three years, or in, maybe in ten years, and because I have conversations with guys that are ten years older than you, and they're saying, "I don't know how it keeps. I keep getting the calls." <laughs> so it, it's it'll keep going in all likelihood. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't, man. Do you know Reeves Gabrels? I know who he is, of course, but I don't know. I haven't met him yet. He's on my list. I get to see him once a year at the Dallas Guitar Show, even though he lives in Nashville. Well, now he lives in London. But, you know, like six or seven years ago, he thought it was he thought he was done for, you know. And then Robert Smith from The Cure. Yeah, I remember them. Called him because Robert Smith was such a Bowie fan who Reeves, you know, had yep. such a long association with. And now Reeves is killing it. Playing with Robert, a touring with Robert. Touring with the Cure. That's Living wild. Fun. 
living in London and being 10 times as successful as he ever was prior. That's awesome. And it's happening in his later years. So like, you know, there are some happy endings. There's some fairy tales that can happen, you know, and which is why my story is, it's, it ain't done, you know. No, like, hell no. I dream, you know. I dream about talking to Pat Metheny. You know, I wanna, I wanna like, I wanna meet Herbie Hancock. I wanna, I wanna get some like wisdom from people like that, you know. And uh, my dad used to say, "As it is in the mind, so it shall be." You know, like everything that's kind of happened to me, I thought about it. You know, forty years ago. I, I kind of willed it. Yeah, you know? I, I totally believe that. You know, and that's not spooky. No, no, know, no, no. That's haywire like, stuff. No, no, no. It's like, you know, just that's, you know, unfortunately, most people don't think positive shit. They think negative shit, and then that's why negative shit happens. Yeah, there's there's something to having a vision. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, I'm never going to learn. I'm not going to learn this Jeff Beck lick or this Larry Carlton lick unless I can visualize myself mastering the lick you know you know like you know i was out with keb mo doing that blues thing that's like one of the greatest years of my life 2013 you know i've never had a blues gig and there was so much grease and mojo i learned that year it was crazy was uh man what's his name was on that uh casey wasner yeah, man, he's a great yeah, guy. Yeah, he's a nice young kid, man. Yeah, he's a good guy. Real good guy. And, and I didn't know how ridiculously talented. Yeah. You know, he was Keb's tech. Yep, he's a monster, though. He's a monster. I went to see Robin Ford, and Casey was the opening act. Yep, you know? he's, he's, playing on, he's playing and producing Robin's album now. I mean, that's yep. insane. Dang. Yeah, he's a very together guy. You know, just puts his head down. What he he called himself? He grew up on a farm, and I said, "Man, that's always a great." You find a guy that grew up on a farm. That guy's going to have a good work ethic. It's just that's the way it is. Because you, he goes, "Yeah, I'm kind of a what's that dog that runs around? It doesn't." Stay? He goes, "I'm a whatever that dog is." He goes, the, uh, "Not a, <sighs> a Labrador, but you know, um, some little dog that's always running around." Um, he goes, "Yeah, that's me." So yeah, he, he he he's he's like that, but man, um, man, I, I can't thank you enough for everything. I really appreciate it. It's been really nice getting to know you, and I'm glad we had to have this conversation. And we'll definitely like, talk more, um, you know, in person for sure. Uh, let me tell people where to find you at least. First of all, Chris is going to be coming out with a record this year, and he's an incredibly talented guy. He's got close to forty songs written, and I would check it out. He's a hell of a a, he's a really talented player and look for him on Facebook for now, but his record's going to be coming out sometime this year and he'll be back on this show to talk about it and we'll promote it when it comes out. So, but keep a heads up for that. And, um, that's it. Check him out out on the road with Peter Cetera. Check him out out on the road with Kenny Loggins. And who else should they pay attention to that you'll be touring with this year? Well, right now, um, right now it's pretty much those two guys. Great. But like, you know, when Brooks and Dunn calls, I go out with them. Um, I'm still that gun for hire. You know, people call, I go out. Um, I, I, I do TV stuff, and you know, it's uh, it's all win win. Awesome. Well, no pay- such as a bad gig. Pay attention to Chris Rodriguez. It's uh, Chris Rodriguez with a Z. And check him out on Facebook, and he'll be letting you know when he's going out on tour. Hey, man, thank you for everything. I really appreciate you sharing your story and um, tell me about your family and all the cool shit you've done. Thank you, Craig. Great talking to you. Likewise. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this uh, interview as much as I did. I didn't even say interview, conversation, as much as I did. And uh, thanks so much to Chris Rodriguez again for spending time with us. I certainly appreciate it. And go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get notified about future episodes along with some cool stuff we're rolling out real soon. Now, be nice. Go play your guitar. And most important, have some fun. That's why you're here in life. Till next time, peace and love. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast. 
and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. Thank you.